Tonight we're going to begin the series on codependency, and I want to kind of take a minute just to define codependency. A lot of people get confused about it. I have a very simple, basic definition for codependency. I define it as any person, place, or thing that I have become dependent on, which means I cannot function without it, that makes my life unmanageable or makes my life crazy. That can be a substance, that can be a person, that can be a job, that can be family, that can be a lot of different things. The key is dependency and unmanageability. Now, in order to kind of explain this to you tonight, what I want to do is I want to do kind of an introduction to codependency and show you how it intertwines with different aspects of addiction. As I said over and over again, God bless you, the core root of all, co of all addiction is codependency, the foundation. I've said this over and over again, that addicts sooner or later, or anybody with any type of addiction, they have to go back and look at their roots, their foundations, so they can actually begin to experience what really is going on deep down inside of them. In order to do this, I want to take you back in time. I want to go back to the year 1925. I wasn't alive, but I'll tell you about it anyway. In 1925, we dealt with things in a very simple way. It was called out of sight, out of mind. If someone had any kind of a problem at all, we either hid them in some sort of psychiatric hospital or we sent them to Aunt Susie in California, geographical changes, and we basically tried to hide the situation, what really was going on. 1935, for the first time in our society, the founders of AA, Dr. Bob and Bill W., had the courage to begin something very special and very beautiful. They put together a program called Alcoholics Anonymous. And for the first time in the late 30s and early 40s, they began to recognize alcohol as an addiction and as a disease. Even doctors came on board. So in the beginning stages, we talked about codependency in a very simple way. Early in the beginnings of, of, of the movement of alcoholism, the founder of alcoholism, Bill W., his wife Lois, began a program called Al-Anon. And we looked at codependency simply as the spouse, the relative, or somebody connected with an alcoholic. So his definition was very simple, very closed. And literally, it was geared towards only someone who was connected with alcohol. In the early 50s into the 60s, we went through a whole period of time in our society. I have a nickname for it, I call it the plastic generation. It's almost as if we had two world wars, a depression, and we decided in the 1950s there'll be no more problems. So everybody went into their own corner, their own place, their own side, and nobody kind of connected with others. And we simply got back into that concept of out of sight, out of mind. In the late 60s and early 70s, we had a revolution in our society something history will talk about for a long time to come. That revolution is referred to as the drug culture. It's almost as if everything that was in the closet came out of the closet. I call it the explosion. See, for years we tried to hide everything. Now all of a sudden, everything became real. So in 1978, a lady had the courage to write a book. The book is called Adult Children of Alcoholics. The lady's name is Janet Lowitz. When Janet wrote that book and had the opportunity on two occasions to meet her, she said all she was trying to do, she was trying to explain what it was like to live in an alcoholic home. In that book, she put together the famous laundry list, the traits and characteristics of an adult child of an alcoholic. In a matter of two years, that book made the New York Times bestseller list. And people started to say, how come all these things pertain to me and my parents weren't alcoholic? So in the addiction field, I always loved the addiction field, were very, very, very creative. In 1983, there actually began a movement, a 12-step program called ACDP. 
adult children of dysfunctional parents. See how we adjust? The bottom line was those traits, those characteristics, those points opened up a whole new door in the field of addiction, opened up another whole era for us to look at. And those traits could actually apply to any dysfunctional family system, no matter what it was, whether it was a substance or anything else. So finally, in 1985, two ladies, Pia Melody and Melody Beatty, wrote two books, Facing Codependency and Codependent No More. And all of a sudden, everything opened up into a whole new direction. And for the first time, we began to identify addictive behavior, addictive behavior patterns, and we began to talk about something called the addictive personality. And as a result then, literally, we began to look at things through a totally different set of eyes. And I'll show you what I mean. If I actually sat each one of you down, and myself included, because I know I've done this already, if I sat you down and asked you to do an inventory of your childhood from ages zero to 10, we say in psychology that by the time you're seven years old, you're formed. We're generous in the addiction field, we give you to 10, what can I tell you? But really in reality, every basic pattern, every fundamental concept of yourself as a person, even how, why you attract the types of people into the life that you attract, are formed in you by the time you are 10 years old. We joke about it in therapy. It takes 10 years to develop these things and then 80 years to work on them. It's not as kind of great. For some of us, 90, what can I tell you? But the concept is, whether you realize it or not, only do you go back and look at your foundations and your basics. Do you truly develop a sense of yourself as an individual, a sense of yourself as a person? And I'll show you what I mean. Believe it or not, in psychology, they actually have a diagram. Now, I, I kind of have to smile at this. I hope you don't mind. But if you actually study Psychology 101, they will give you a diagram of how life is supposed to happen. OK? They'll actually give you an actual diagram of how life is supposed to happen. Now, watch. From ages 0 to 10 are referred to as the foundation years. They're the years when all of your patterns and your basic concepts are formed. I'm going to go back to that in a couple of minutes. Believe it or not, in the first 10 years of your life, you are supposed to experience from your family systems. Now, notice my terminology. I said family systems. When you're born, when you come into this world, you enter into, without knowing it, five different families. You enter into what we refer to as the family of origin, which is your blood family. You enter into your neighborhood, your cultural, or your environment family. You enter into your peer family. You enter into a religious family system. I'm sure that when I was one month old, I would jump up and down in my crib and say, please baptize me Catholic. My parents took me and placed me into their belief system. It really wasn't mine. But in reality, it was theirs. So as a result then, literally, I kind of developed it as my normal. We also enter in a society family. Today especially, children are bombarded with thousands and thousands and thousands of messages. They're influenced in all different areas of their life today. So if you go back and look at those first 10 years, you can see what effect they have on you in your growth process and who you are as an individual and who you are as a person. Now, you're a little baby. You're coming into the world. You're joining all these families. As a child, you have five basic fundamental expectations of your family system. You expect your family to give you what I call the five basic spiritual principles of life. Now I'm going to tell you a secret. Don't tell anybody, okay? 
These five basic principles, if you don't get them when you're a child, you will search for them throughout your whole entire life. And that's where it does affect us and connect with us. So there are five basic fundamental spiritual foundations every child searches for in life if they are to grow and be able to be a healthy person. Number one, to feel safe, safety. No one can do any growing in life unless they feel safe. Safety is the core and the center of all growth. The second is unconditional love, to be accepted and to be loved unconditionally. The natural need and natural expectation of every basic little child. The third one is fundamental security, food, shelter, clothing, the basics, the fundamentals of life. I expect my family system to literally give them to me. Fourthly, I expect them to give me something called life skills, basic fundamental life skills. And by the way, there are three of them. Number one is socialization, to teach me how to socialize, how to interact with other human beings. Secondly, to teach me how to play so I can be a kid. Teach me how to play, to be able to celebrate and be who I am. And thirdly, to teach me the gift of intimacy, the beautiful aspect of intimacy, so I can trust, I can share, I can feel comfortable, and I can grow. And finally, I expect my family system to give me an identity. Who am I? What am I all about? Where do I come from? What's my history? A person without a history does not exist. Your history is your foundation. As a child, I expect these things from my family system. Now, if these things are given to me as a child, then I'm ready for the second stage of life, which the books tell us takes place between 11 and 14. We call that the stage of crisis. During the ages when I have no idea what I am, my hormones are all over the place, I'm going through all kinds of changes. I'm starting my little rebellion, and I got a lot of confusion going on. If I have all my foundations in place, I have the foundations to help me go through that stage of crisis. Then they tell us the next stage is from 15 to about 20, 21. They call that the stage of conflict. I call it the war zone. But really, in reality, what are you doing? As teenagers, you are engaging in a war with your family. It's called the battle for independence, which, by the way, is normal. There's supposed to be a conflict and a struggle. But if people are healthy, they can do it in a healthy way. The book then tells us from 22 to 26, you are supposed to become a totally totally independent person. I really had a smile at that one. And then finally, from 26 to 120, you are now an adult. Congratulations. You're now ready for the stage of commitment, for the stage of decision making. You are ready to make decisions that will affect you for the rest of your life. Now do me a favor. Forget the ages, but don't forget the process. Because I truly believe, and I share this in my own way, I didn't even know, because I went through my crisis, my conflict, around 35 or 40. I was a late bloomer, what can I tell you? But the concept is, we literally have to go through these stages, but nobody can predict the ages we're going to go through them. It's all based on what goes on in the course of our journey in life. Now watch what happens. If I don't get my basic needs met when I'm a child, if my normal as a child, instead of those five basic fundamental spiritual principles, if my normal as a child is fear and guilt, I got to put them first because I'm Italian. What can I tell you? It's kind of natural. We're, we're trained well in that direction. 
If my normal is abandonment, if my normal is abuse, if my normal is shame, if I experience a lot of uncertainty, if a lot of anxiety, a lot of tension, a lot of coldness, if these are my normals as a child, I don't feel safe. I don't feel unconditional love. I don't really have an identity. I become scared and I become afraid. So I have no idea at all where I'm going in life. So what do I do? In order to be able to survive life, I develop certain behavior patterns. We call them survivor patterns. Here's the unfortunate point. So many people are surviving life instead of living life. I don't know about you, but I spent a good 46 years of my life just surviving. It took me a long time to come to an awakening to realize the fact I wanted more. And so many of us have a tendency just to get through life and not be able to live. So what I want to share with you tonight are what I call the three basic fundamental foundations of codependency, or I basically call them the behaviors of survival skills for codependence. I put them in the three categories. Many of us become isolators, avoiders. Many of us become fantasizers, another form of avoidance, by the way. And many of us become caretakers. Now, there are many of us tonight, probably, that will fit all three. Congratulations. That means you win the jackpot. That means you're the ultimate codependent, like I am. What can I tell you? But the amazing part about it is these are simply behavior patterns. We pick them up. They become our normal. And as a result, then, they can lend us, lead us into addiction because in the reality of it, in many ways, addiction is a way to run away from things we don't want to look at, we don't want to deal with. Let's begin with the isolator. Isolators normally are children that fit the following profile. These are children that come from homes and environments where everything is empty, cold, homes that where kids experience major issues of abandonment, these are kids that grew up in homes, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. I call them the children of fear. They're empty, they're lonely, they're scared, they're afraid. So what do they do? When they become adults, very many times they migrate towards the following addictions. One of the addictions we never really talk too much about, but I think in the future we will is something called institutional addiction. I refer to it as the professional patient. See, the mental health industry can very easily become a hiding place. I find myself a therapist. The isolators are good at this. I take the sucker hostage, and I expect him to be everything that I didn't get when I was a child. Remember the movie, What About Bob? Totally amazing. That means he can't take a vacation, he can't breathe, and he better be there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, always available. Otherwise, I'll make his life miserable. It's called Rent-A-Parent. I pay you a fee, now congratulations, you're my parent. Give me all the things I never got before. If I really get sick, they put me into an institution. I get three meals a day. I get the warm fuzzies. And I get free tickets to the ball game. Isn't that wonderful? I never did that in my family. So what do I do? I become addicted to institutions. They become my family. They become my home. They're a place I go to to get those things I talked about back in the beginning. And after a while, it becomes like an addiction. We also see this very many times in other institutions, such as the prison system. <laughs> Having been connected as a chaplain for many years, I realized the fact that the prison system 
can very easily become another institution because, guess what? Abused children make excellent prisoners. It's their normal, they're used to it, it's a home, it's better than being on the street. We can almost adjust to any pattern. We can even make education an addiction. I become a professional student, never have to feel. All I have to do is think, read books. I got 27 degrees, I'm 69, and I'm still going to school. See, everything's up here. I call the codependent, I say, this is our control tower. It's our crazy tower where I got to figure everything out. I got to be in charge of everything. I got to control everything. I want to always make sure I'm in charge now because I'm not going back to what it was before. Other addictions that come under this can very easily fall into the same category. You know, I can easily even make religion an addiction. I can say, God will take care of everything. I ain't got to do anything. And just sit back and wait. Remember the story about the guy sitting on top of the roof in the floods? And he prays, and God sends him a boat. And he says, don't worry, God will take care of it. And then God sends him, you know, an airplane or a helicopter to pick him up. He says, don't worry, God will take care of it. Then he drowns and goes to heaven, and he says to God, I prayed, and you didn't take care of it. He said, what, are you crazy? I sent you a boat, I sent you a helicopter. The concept is we have to be able to look at the things in the world and be connected to it and learn from it. And also under the isolator comes the isolator love addict, love addiction. Very scary. Very simple and very plain. I'm empty, I'm lonely, I'm scared, and I'm afraid. The first person that comes along that treats me nice, that sucker is mine. If you try to get away, I'll kill you. See how simple it is? It's called possession. I want to drain people dry. I call it the Dracula relationship. I literally want to, you to be everything for me. We joke about this in codependent circles. There's an old phrase they talk about in recovery all the time when people first come in. They say, if you truly love someone, let them go. If they're supposed to come back, they'll come back. The codependent says, if you truly love someone, follow them and stalk them. <laughs> if they try to get away, kill them. That's the cry of the codependent. It's that concept of control, manipulation. You belong to me. I got papers on you. I bought you at the Acme. <laughs> See, the concept is I expect you to be everything I never had before. The other addiction that comes under this area is the isolator, drug addict, and alcoholic. And these are what 64% of all the addicts are in our society. These are the functional addicts. These are the ones that show up for work every day. These are the ones you will never, ever, ever know they've got a drug or an alcohol problem because they are extremely, extremely, extremely good at taking somebody hostage that will clean their messes up for them, that will cover for them, that will enable them, and will hide for them. They're really good at this. So as a result then, their addiction is done in secret. Everything's behind closed doors. They're used to living that way. It becomes a normal for them. They live in that crazy world. The other addiction that comes under isolation is the isolator anorexic, anorexia. Another addiction we talk very little about. 80% of all anorexics are female, and you come from homes that have been abandoned by their father. So as a result, then, very many times, they end up wanting to remain a child. So if you starve your body and shut your body down, you begin to shut down and close off, and somebody always has to take care of you. It's a way to run away, a way to hide, a way to always remain a child, always remain being taken care of all the time. It's a scary, scary disease. You know, so many of us have experienced this and gone through it. It's a very powerful process. Let's move on now to the fantasizer. Fantasizers are normally children who come out of homes and environments where they've experienced major, major issues of shame. These are kids that are sexually abused. 
These are kids that are incested. These are kids that live in homes and places where they're you know, embarrassed by their family. These are the kids that will never take anybody home. These are the kids who are scared to come home themselves. These are the kids that if school was left open 24 hours a day, they would stay there. Anything to avoid going home. I call them the children of shame. At a very, very, very early age, they learn how to tell stories, make up stories. We call them lies, but really in reality, they're not lies. They're disassociating. They can't deal with the shame. They create their fantasy world, their make-believe world. Now, we had a situation with a young girl in the third grade, and a teacher just said to her one day, how come your parents never come to the PTA meeting? She said, my father's a Secret Service agent. He can't go out of the house. Her father was a drunk. He was scared. But see, she creates the fantasy daddy. She can tell everybody about. And the scary part about that is they truly, truly, truly believe what they're saying. It's their way to cope and deal with the hurt and pain going on inside of them. They can't deal with the real world or what's happening to them, so they create the fantasy world and live in the fantasy world. Now, when they become adults, this then becomes their normal. So many times as adults, they can migrate towards drugs and alcohol. Their life can become very unmanageable because the shame is so powerful they're embalming themselves. But if anybody actually confronts them or says anything to them, their response will be, not me, must be somebody else. It's called disassociation again. You know, it's amazing so many times when you look at the fantasy addict because I worked for years in the prison system. And very many times I experienced prisoners who literally created unbelievable crimes. And they would tell me that basically they didn't do any of it. It's all a mistake, even though there were 10 witnesses that saw what they did. The bottom line is I learned something. They truly believed what they were saying. It was their way to survive. There was a way to avoid and get away from the shame. Shame is a powerful, powerful process. You come right down to it. That's why so many secrets are connected with aspects of shame. It's a really powerful process. Now, watch what happens. Under this idea of the fantasizer come some very powerful addictions. Sexual addiction, sex addict, the gambler, compulsive shopper, compulsive spender, People refer to refer to them as the secret addictions. These are all the addictions that literally take place in a separate world. You can experience this in things such as the pedophile, because very many times these are individuals who live two different lives. When they're in their fantasy world, the other world does not exist. In some ways, you can almost describe them sometimes when they're in their addiction as almost multiple, multiple personalities. They literally go to one world to avoid the other world because they can't deal with what's happening to them. Children that were abused have a tendency very many times to block the abuse, the trauma, and literally live a different world because they can't handle or face what's going on inside of them. It's a very powerful experience. <coughs> he has something we all have to go through. It's real scary. The other area that comes under this is what I refer to as the fantasy love addict. We have a nickname for them in the world today. We call them players, the fantasy love addict. What that means is simply this. If I can't have you, then I want you. If you become available, get lost. I don't mind the clandestine. I don't mind the craziness. I don't mind the insanity. I don't mind the secret relationship. But as soon as you bring me into reality, I can't handle it. I can't handle it. At that point, I break it. I'm addicted to the rush, to the craziness, to the insanity. I'm addicted to the clandestine and the secretive. It's a real scary concept. 
We also see under this particular area, very many times, what I refer to as the fantasy workaholic. I have to kind of bring this one out. The fantasy workaholic is a person that works at jobs that are doomed to failure. And yet at the same time, they think that it's wonderful and it's great. I'll give you an example. I had a lady come in here one time, and basically she brought her husband along with her. Now you have to understand this. You could tell he didn't want to be there. You know, he had the ball and chain around his leg. She was dragging him through the door. She finally got him into the room. So he sat there in a corner, and she said to me, Vince, I want you to explain something to this man. He has two fantastically expensive trucks. He's in the trucking business. He gets up every morning at 4.30, works at the truck all day long, works till 11.30 at night, is driving himself seven days a week, pushing himself like crazy. He has two trucks. He only has one employee himself. I still can't get through and say, why we have two trucks? Then she, he turns and says to me, I don't know what's wrong with this crazy lady. I bring in close to $2,800 to $3,000 a week. And she brought the books with her. She said, but our expenses are $4,400 a week. We're on the brink of bankruptcy. His response was very simple. I won't use the terms he used. I don't know what this crazy lady does with my money. You have to blame somebody else. Because I can't face, I can't deal with it. I'm living in this fantasy world, this make-believe world, where to me everything's wonderful and great. Everything around me is falling apart. And the gambler comes under that. See, gamblers don't care if they win or lose. They're addicted to the rush, the excitement, and the fantasy. I've seen gamblers win and never pick their money up. They don't care. The rush is over. It's the rush. It's the craziness. It's the hoopla that goes along with it. You see in the casinos, all the lights and the noise and the concept and everything, it all plays right into that. It's all part of the process that goes along with it. Fantasy. Scary. Now, let's get down to the third one, which I, I, if you have about seven hours, I'll talk about it, because <laughs> I know it, it's, it's my category, so it's a lot of fun. The caretaker. The caretaker is the goody two-shoes kid. These are the kids that go from 3 to 43. In short, no childhood. These are the super responsible, fantastically wonderful kids who are told at a very early age that they have to be responsible. Whether you realize it or not, they are usually, as adults, very, 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 very angry people. But watch. If you ask them how they're doing, they'll say to you, I'm fine. I don't have any problems. What's your problem? Please be careful when you say, I'm fine. We have a definition of the word fine. I can't say the first word. I'll just change it. It means I am a frustrated, insecure, neurotic person. Congratulations, you're fine. See, caretakers grow up feeling this great sense of responsibility. Think about it for a minute. You say to a six-year-old, you're the man of the family now. What do I got to do, get a job? It's scary. But all these messages telling me I've got to be responsible all the time. So I feel this urge to be responsible. As a result, I become like a little controller because I have to be responsible all the time. So as a result, then when I grow up, what do I do? I migrate towards certain behaviors. For example, the caretaker workaholic. They're amazing. These are individuals, basically, who love to work in the service-based industries. They will work long, long, long hours. But please, whatever you do, do not pay them too much. They get very upset. I'll tell you a secret. If you want to make a lot of money, here's what you do. 
Start your own business. If you need 15 workers, hire five caretakers. Every caretaker that does the work are three people, not a problem. But here's the rules. Caretakers always have rules. You must give me total control of the whole entire company. You stay out of it. I'll run it for you. I'll do a good job. Ten foot snowstorm, you'll be open. Don't worry about it. I don't take any days off. I don't do anything. I'm always there. I'm always on the ball. I'm always right. At the same time, what am I doing? I'm always bitching, griping, screaming, and complaining. You see, if you run that company, they're going to talk about you like crazy and tell you how terrible you are. But guess what? Don't you dare try to interfere because they're in charge. See that? It's that anger inside of them. It's scary. As a result, then, they feel like they're responsible for everything. It's a crazy behavior they put themselves through, and it drives them crazy. And they drive everybody else crazy, too. It's part of the process. I always love telling this wonderful story. Did you ever see a caretaker call out sick when they're not sick? By the way, this is something I really someday would like to see on a sitcom on TV. It would put Archie Bunker to shame. It's totally amazing. I'm going to call out sick the next day, but I'm not really sick. So if you live with someone who's going to do that, get a motel room. They're going to spend the whole entire night getting their story ready for the next day. And by the time the next day comes, they will have a story beyond story. Now, 7 o'clock comes the next morning. What do they do? Real simple. They literally, the next day, they literally make that phone call at 7 o'clock. When they make that phone call, watch what happens. The person on the other end has just worked 11 to 7. They could care less whether you're coming in or not. So you say, I'm not coming in today, but now I've got to tell you why. The person on the other says, okay, hang up. Now you've got a problem. <laughs> they didn't give me a chance to tell my story. Now I've got to walk around all day wondering what they're thinking. The next thing I have to worry is maybe I better not go out of the house. They might see me. This is your day off, by the way. Make yourself half nuts. You've got another whole day to work on the story. Then you go back to work the next day, and you walk in, and here's the killer for the caretaker. Nobody even missed you. So what do you do? You run around all day trying to tell them the story they don't want to hear. It's totally amazing because you feel guilty, you feel bad, drive yourselves crazy. God, we knock ourselves nuts with guilt. We want everybody to like us. Make ourselves half crazy. We drive people crazy. You know, it's, it's, it's funny sometimes when you look at this because caretakers don't know their worth. And they get scared of their worth. The other part of it which fits right into the caretaker, besides the workaholic, is the caretaker love addict. These are individuals individuals who love to be involved in relationships with sickies. The sicker, the better. Bring me your sick and your deprived, and I will take care of them. There's only one rule, though. Don't you dare get better, because I'm going to bitch about you, gripe about you, and complain about you all day long. You see, I love it. Because I'm taking care of you. You down here, me up here. Me in charge. I'm the boss. I'm going to tell you what you're supposed to do, but don't you do it. There's a lady in Pensacola, and I just love this. I, when I used to go visit my aunt in Pensacola, you know, she used to come over, and she would constantly have tea with us. I never forget. You know, a little Italian lady, she would come in, and she would talk about her husband, the bum. I've been living with this bum for 40 years. He's a bum. He does nothing. He watches TV. I cook. I clean. I do this. I do that. You know. So I said to her one day, just down, after listening to this for so long, I said, why do you stay with him? She got really angry at me, and she said, because I love him. I want to tell you a secret. 
God forbid that man ever tried to do anything. She'd kill him. Totally amazing. It's her house. She's in charge. He's only a lodger there. She runs the ball game. That control is so scary. A big part of codependency. The other addiction that comes under the, the caretaker is the compulsive overeater. Whether you realize it or not, compulsive overeating is directly connected to a lot of anger and a lot of rage. A lot of holding stuff inside. Literally burying stuff inside of yourself. And I can speak from experience on this one. I never realized how I spent most of my life hiding and running away and not feeling what was going on inside of me. And realizing the fact that I carried that stuff for so long. And it's amazing what we do to ourselves. It's like we put layers around us to protect us. To avoid feeling and being in touch with feelings. What I'm trying to share with you tonight, these behaviors, these characteristics are all interconnected. Because literally, many of us find different ways to survive. I can literally, you know, find all kinds of ways to survive. Even the caretaker. We have the caretaker, drug addict, and alcoholic. I call them the legal addicts. These are the ones, the pill poppers, things of this effect, but everything's done legally, above board, you know, alcohol behind closed doors, but literally, I, I don't really get drunk or anything, I just kind of sedate myself. You know, just kind of take the edge off, so I live in a different world. What I'm really doing is sedating the anger and the hurt inside of me and the pain. See, to always have to be responsible is extremely scary in the process with it. Now, when you look at these behaviors and these characteristics, I know I'm kind of spending a lot of time tonight talking about these behaviors and these characteristics because I truly believe that so many of us migrate towards them because we have never taken the time to stand still long enough to really find out who we are and to really take the time to look at our own life and our own growth process. So what I want to do in the time to come, I want to be able to literally spend the next four weeks talking about and explaining codependency to you. Because I know how much this has helped me on my growth and my process. You know, I want to spend most of the next week talking about family systems and how they affect us and the aspect of it. And I'll give you the opportunity to be able to take a look at your own family systems. In the third week, we'll talk about how to play and how to have fun. Most of their children, most codependents, we take life very seriously. We analyze ourselves to death. We don't know how to play and have fun. We don't know how to laugh. We need a sense of humor. In the fourth week, we'll talk about codependency and relationships and why we have such a hard time with relationships because our foundations aren't there. In the fifth week, we'll talk about the roles that codependents play, how we migrate into these roles, not even knowing we're migrating into them because we're trained to be in them. And then we'll spend four weeks on the recovery process. We'll take you through the whole process and show you how it works. It's a very powerful process. What I've learned over the years, this is the process that helped me tremendously to make a lot of major changes in my own life, to look at life totally differently, but to realize the fact that whether you realize it or not, I am 50% my mom, 50% my dad, and guess what? So are you. Congratulations. You have their traits, you have their characteristics, and the secret of recovery, as we'll see later on, you've been able to identify them, get in touch with them, and they've been able to adjust them positively. You can't change your history, but you can learn powerful lessons from it. You can adjust them in a positive way. And the secret to recovery is getting to know yourself and being comfortable being you. And being able to work on getting those needs met from people as healthy to get them met from. So it really means taking the time to slow down and take your time. Now, I'm going to share this with the, the real heavy car carrying codependents in the room. Notice this series is a nine-week series. There are many codependents who would like me to make it into a one-night series. So by midnight, you can figure the whole thing out and solve it by 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. 
They always tell me, what book should I read? Oh, the classic ones. I've got to share this one with you before we close. And by the way, I forgot to do this. I'm going to get in trouble. I know I am. Well, I mean, let me share this with you before I close. You know, a lady came up to me one time, and I will never forget this. She came up to me, and she literally said, this stuff on codependency really rings home. She said, Vince, what books can I buy to bring to my therapist so I can actually help my therapist to be able to help me deal with codependency? Now, that's a real codependent. She's going to train her own therapist. Isn't that amazing? Most therapists have to pay a lot of money to get trained. So I said to her, why don't you just go to a therapist who understands codependency? That'd be a simple solution. You know what her response to me was? I can't leave my therapist. She'll feel bad. I've been with her all these years. I have to try to help her. Ooh, that's scary. But see that concept again? I'm going to train you to take care of me. Wow. How many people in relationships have done that? I'm going to fix that sucker. I'll make him into what I want him to be. And if he doesn't become it, I'll beat him up. Real simple and real plain. So I hope this helps you at least understand the traits and characteristics of codependency, what they are and what they're really all about. What we will now do next week is we'll, we'll concentrate primarily on family systems and how those family systems are.